Well, uh, like Colin said, it's been a while since I've been back. So if it's terrible, then we know why. And if it's great, glory to God. So uh, I'm happy to be back though. And uh, like you said, I'm Oakley and I am the women's director for young adults. Um, So it's been a while, but I am extremely excited to get to share, one, to just be a part of this series, but then two, to get to talk about what God's been teaching me and something that he's been challenging me personally in. Uh, So we're just gonna kind of dive in. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we've been in our Take Heart series. Uh, And so kind of our heart behind that, uh, our thought process when we decided we wanted to launch into the year talking about that, was we wanted to look at scripture and see what scripture told us about God's heart for people, God's heart for you and I, and how out of that we can be confident in walking into what he has purposed for us. So last week, Andy kind of did a spinoff of that, more of a personalized message of how do we take heart personally and what does that look like day in and day out in our walk with Christ? And tonight, I kind of want to zoom out just a bit from that lens and talk about how we take heart collectively as God's church. Uh, Let's look at scripture tonight, and as we kind of study the Bible, we're going to get to see what is God's heart for all people, how do we see Jesus model the Father's love, and then ultimately, what does this mean for our calling into that same mission God's love, we're gonna see, has been for all people, from all nations, for all time. And so how can we draw confidence that what he has planned and purposed since the very beginning when he created us as his people, he will accomplish and promises to accomplish. And how we get to now be a part of that as his church, having a unique identity and calling in that plan. Uh, Back in the start of 2023, Uh, I had this, I'm not really a big resolutions person um, or really even like a words person. I'm just like, ah, you know, it's just the new year. But back in 2023, I really had this goal. And I had this goal, it sounds so silly now saying it out loud. I had this goal that I wanted at the end of the year to be able to do at least one unassisted pull-up. And I know what you're saying, like, Oakley, you look super strong. That doesn't, it surprises me. And I know, I, that was more laughs than I thought I would get, honestly, from that, so it's fine. Um, but I really had this goal. I was like, I'm gonna do this unassisted pull-up by the end of the year. And that was my one resolution. And so I went to the gym and I worked out and I actually really tried very hard the whole year um, and then get to the end of the year. And by the time that it reached December, I was unsuccessful and did not do a pull-up by the end of last year. So that is transferring over to this year. Stay tuned, check back in and just December, see if I end up accomplishing that. Uh, but my point in just really kind of exposing myself there is that I had this great intention starting last year uh, that did not end the way that I expected it to. Uh, and maybe that's for you kind of even with just New Year's resolutions. Um, we're into February now. I don't know about you guys. For, for me, there was at least twice I woke up in January and thought, I think it should be August. And I don't know how we're still in January, but here we are. Uh, And so maybe you had good intentions coming into this year. Maybe some of you, your resolutions have not worked out the best so far. Uh, Or maybe just in general, there's been things that your heart was right, but it didn't turn out the way that you had hoped. And as we kind of start our time together tonight, we're actually gonna kind of look back at the beginning part of the book of Genesis and see that God's heart and his intentions when he created the world and humanity were pure and holy and perfect and by no fault of his own, but by us and our hearts that are sinful and corrupt and uh, prone to wander after other things besides God, we corrupted that plan, sin is introduced, and now uh, that perfect plan has been fractured. And so we look at the beginning parts of Genesis, really in the first 11 chapters, it kind of spirals pretty quickly. Uh, We have creation, obviously, but then the fall enters in pretty quick. Adam and Eve, after a few crafty words from a snake, uh, decide to fall into sin and separates us uh, from our creator from now, from that point on. Um, We have the first recorded instance of murder when Cain, Adam and Eve's son, decides to murder his brother. Humanity continues to become so corrupt that God sends a flood to wipe out everything and everyone except Noah's family and an ark of animals. And then finally, people once again turn to themselves and wanna make a name for themselves and so decide to build a tower to the heavens and God scatters them, changes up their languages and confuses them and scatters them across the earth. So God's heart is pure. His intention has been from the beginning when he created Adam and Eve to be in relationship with man and woman. 
He wanted to be close to us, and yet we sin and corruption enters into the picture. Although this was kind of the spiral in the beginning of scripture, what I wanna point out, what I wanna camp on for the rest of our time together is that God's heart and his plans and purposes for all of humanity, for you and I, have never once changed. They've never been deterred or distracted, even in the face of all of this chaos. When God created us, he longed for that intimacy. Even though we sin, God still desires relationship with us. He loves us as his people. And what we're gonna see as we move into chapter 12 of Genesis is that he begins to put into motion a beautiful story of redemption for the entire world. We're gonna see him commissioning Abram, which we now kind of know as Abraham, but Abram when he was first commissioned. And when he was first commissioned, I don't know if many people know this, but uh, he was an old man and he was worshiping other idols besides God. And so God commissions him and invites him into this adventure to go and to be blessed, to then be a blessing to all nations and people everywhere on behalf of the true God, Yahweh. So I want us to look at Genesis 12, verses one through three. We're gonna read what the Lord says to Abram. He starts off and he says, "'Go from your country and your kingdom "'and your father's house to the land that I will show you. "'I will make you a great nation, "'and I will bless you and make your name great "'so that you will be a blessing. "'I will bless those who bless you, "'and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God calls Abram, and Abram, in a spirit of radical obedience, chooses faithfulness, leaving behind everything he's ever known to say yes to a God that chose to personally reveal himself to him. God tells Abram that he's going to bless him, and not only that, but he's blessing him so that he can go and be a blessing to the nations. So my first point tonight is that we are blessed to be a blessing. Looking back, I wanna reread exactly what God says to Abram. Go from your country and your kingdom and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Out of all the nations, God chooses one man from one nation to reach an entire world. When Abram was called, I'm sure he had no idea exactly how that was gonna play out. But Abram's purpose was so much bigger than just his own life, just what one man could accomplish on his own. God's beginning this narrative in scripture where he's asking the world to come and to see what I'm gonna do through Abraham and his family, but not just for them, but for the entire world, so that you can be pointed back to my glory and my love. God's redeeming his people. God's making Abram a blessing. To, God's blessing him to be a blessing. Uh, when I was in middle school, um, which maybe I guess won't surprise you because I can't do a pull-up still today, I was uh, one of the shortest and scrawniest people in my grade. And so maybe you can commiserate with me on this, but when it came time to pick anything uh, sports related, to pick teams, to pick people to be on your team, I was always the last one to be picked. They didn't know I was scrappy, but that my size, I was just small and I just, you know, no one thought I was athletic. So I was always the last one to get picked. And I think about this whenever I think about um, what Abram was doing and what he was going through. And oftentimes I think about this in relation to my own life, even now, in my spiritual walk with the Lord. Back then it was physical stature and it's funny and you know, you grow out of those things, but you don't really grow out of sin. And so I think even now that I'm like, okay, yeah, God, you, you, you pick us to be on your team, but do you really know how, how broken I am? And, and you probably should pick someone different, someone else that's a little more useful for your team. If you really knew all of who I was, would you still want me to come and to be a part of this call, to be a part of this blessing? I wonder if Abram ever thought that. I didn't even serve you, God. I'm really old. There's a lot of excuses as to why I shouldn't be called into this purpose. And yet what was freeing for me to be reminded of as someone was walking me through this passage not that long ago was that God, even, even people 
that Abram was never gonna meet and never gonna know. God wanted to bless Abraham so that that lineage and his family would carry on, even to you and I today, so that we can know more of God's heart for us as his people because of the way that he called Abraham and blessed him despite his limitations. Despite him not being maybe the A team for this calling, God looked at him and said, I can still use you. And not only that, I'm gonna use you and the ripple effect of me losing, using you is gonna reach nations far beyond people you're ever gonna meet. Generations far after you're long gone, God's gonna continue to work and continue to bless people through Abraham's testimony and through his story. He was chosen by God, gifted in order to give, to pour out to others. And as we continue on through that narrative for 2,000 years throughout the Old Testament, we see this story play out less than perfectly God's people time and time again choose other things besides God. And God time and time again remains patient with them and pursues them and loves them and provides a way back to himself. So despite our imperfections, despite us being weak, God continues to use, God continues to bless. Like we mentioned earlier, his plans are not deterred. His heart is for people, people everywhere, and it will be accomplished. He will show them, I love you and I care about you. And that's been his mission all along. So finally, as we end our time in the Old Testament, Abram's story continuing through generations down, we have this period of 400 years of silence in between the Old and New Testament writings. And then we see in the beginning of the Gospels, our story reach a triumphant, climactic point where God's very son came to walk among us on earth in the form of Jesus, fully God and fully man. God says, I'm not done here. I'm gonna provide a way that's perfect and going to be the complete fulfillment for all of my plans here for all of humanity. So my second point tonight is that God's plan for redemption becomes human. Jesus finally enters onto the scene, humbling himself to take on flesh and walk among us. And when he identifies his public ministry in Luke 4, this is what he says about himself. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's citing back some Old Testament writing that was prophesying about this time when Jesus would finally come onto the scene. He's introducing himself and really introducing this kingdom of God movement in a new and final way by becoming God in the flesh to provide salvation for people everywhere. Reiterating over and over and over again that God's heart is for people from all nations everywhere. What he finds though, as he comes on to the scene, is that God's chosen people, Abraham's lineage, the Israelites, who God had said, I'm gonna bless you to be a blessing so everyone that sees you will know that I am your God and know that I am good. They've become over the years closed off and exclusive. We see this through the Pharisees, if you're familiar with any of the, the gospel writings, is that the Pharisees, this religious elite group of people, had now put in place so many rules and regulations that it actually served to close off the gospel to any outsider and keep only this religious elite group of people in kind of the know, in God's good graces, doing so much to earn God's favor and God's love made it way more difficult and hard to come into the open and welcome embrace that God's offered for all of eternity. And what Jesus is gonna do is he's going to write this, turn it upside down on its head and show them actually what God's heart is by not only the words that he speaks, but the life and example that he lives. Jesus is gonna show them uh, later on as he tells them in this great commissioning text in Matthew 8, 28, that he wants us as his church to go out and do what he has done to love people from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth. But what I think is so beautiful is that before we get there, which we will, we're gonna kind of dive into what that looks like for us today. But before he even speaks those words out as explicitly as he does in Matthew 28, before going to be back with the Father, we see Jesus model this through the life that he lives by taking this good news to Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So by the time that he speaks this over his disciples and begins the early church movement, 
It's as if they would probably look at what he's saying and look back and say, was he not doing this all along? Was he not showing us that this was exactly what he came to do to proclaim this news to all people everywhere? It's like those movies that you watch where at the end, it's kind of in the middle, you're a little bit confused as to what's happening. And, and then at the end, it all makes sense. And if you ever go back and rewatch that movie, you kind of piece those things together earlier than you would before. And I imagine the disciples kind of having this aha moment, looking at what he's telling them as he's going back to be with the Father. And it's like, yeah, this is exactly what he's been doing all along. So I want to look at the book of John to kind of show us where Jesus does this and how he sets the example, not only for the disciples, but for you and I. In John 1, he's identified as the light and life of the world. And as we move into John 3, we're gonna see this commission statement before Jesus even spoke it years down, down the road come to pass in the life that he's living, starting in Jerusalem. In John 3, verses one through 21, we see a pretty popular narrative of Jesus speaking to a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to him in the dead of night to ask him questions about who he is and what God's plan is. And Jesus so graciously shares with him what it looks like to be born again. He says that whoever believes in the Son of Man will have eternal life. So starting his ministry in Jerusalem, he speaks with a religious elitist, a Pharisee, to tell him this good news, this gospel message. As you continue on in John 3, we see Jesus take his disciples to the countryside of Judea. John the Baptist is there baptizing his other disciples, and Jesus joins in and begins to baptize alongside John the Baptist. Even John the Baptist's disciples are confused by this and begin to question, John, do you not see this guy? People are going after him now and, and wanting to be baptized by Jesus. And John says, as it should be, he must become greater and I must become less. Even John says in verse 36 of chapter three that whoever believes in the son has eternal life. We progress on into chapter four of John and we see Jesus move out of the countryside of Judea to intentionally pass through the land of Samaria on his way to Galilee. This is one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. Jesus stops on his way to speak to a woman that is at the well in the middle of the day. Not only that, but she is a Samaritan woman. Samaria, so the Samaritans and the Jews really had a lot of tension between each other. The Samaritans were a group of people that were kind of this, this mixed, half Gentile, half Jew, pagan worshiping people. And so the Jewish people would go out of their way to never actually have to talk to the Samaritans. And we see Jesus do the exact opposite of that, go straight through the heart of Samaria, stop to talk to this woman. What I love about this passage is that it's actually the longest recording of Jesus having a personal interaction with anyone in scripture. It's a woman, it's a Samaritan woman. And then on top of that, the cherry on top, in my opinion, is that he identifies himself as the Messiah while he's talking with her. There are so few people that he does that with in scripture. And as he's sitting talking with her by the well, he tells her that he is the Messiah, the one that has to come. We read this and we look at all that Jesus is doing for this woman, healing her, providing for her, showing her who he is. There's also another part that he's doing here. And he's teaching his disciples all along the way. He's challenging their worldview to show them, these are the people that I've come for the marginalized, the poor, the oppressed, the ones that are on the outskirts. I have come so they can know me and have hope. And what I think is unique about this in contrast to his conversation that he had with the Pharisee Nicodemus just a chapter prior is that Nicodemus comes to him in the middle of the night and he leaves still kind of scratching his head wondering, I don't really know if that Jesus guy is who he says that he is. What we see about the woman at the well is that she immediately goes and tells every single person in her village, this man knew everything about me, come and see who he is. And it says that many people in her town believed in her testimony and believed in the teaching of Jesus. He's starting to reach further and further, moving to all people because he has a desire for all people to know him. Even as we move on to the end of chapter four, we see this ends of the earth kind of commission come to pass when Jesus has a conversation with an official that seeks him out because his son is sick. This Roman official's son is sick and dying and he comes and entreats Jesus to come and heal his son. And so Jesus, instead of turning this man away, 
promises to provide healing for this man's son so that when this official goes back to his house and sees that his son has been healed, it says in verse 53 that this official believed as well as all of his household in the testimony of Jesus. We see him walk from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, setting an example for his disciples, challenging their worldview, challenging this bubble of comfort that they'd come to live in, that they're the chosen and they're the people that God loves the most. When God says, no, 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 I have loved you because I wanted you to go out and to love everyone and to share this good news with them. This come and see that God has implemented when we look back at Genesis 12, now becomes this go and tell. Go and live out what I have shown you through my life. So we see this invitation from Jesus himself to be a part of what he is doing through redeeming people. And that leads me to my third and final point, that Jesus gives us our identity. In his redemption story, Jesus not only shows us the full extent of God's love for people, but he also shows us our mission in his kingdom by commissioning us and giving us new identity and new purpose. We see in a couple different texts throughout the gospels, starting in John 20, 21, where Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. There's a new identity spoken over us in that commission alone, where it says that you are sent. You are sent. Luke 24, 46 through 48, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. You are witnesses. New identity. Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. You are proclaimers. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, probably the, the most well-known of the passages, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You are disciple makers. And Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You are empowered. You are empowered all through this. God sending your witnesses, proclaiming. You are disciple makers that are empowered through the Holy Spirit. He's reiterating this identity, speaking it over us time and time again. Who are we? We are God's chosen people to carry out this message of grace. If I were to squish all of these verses together to kind of make this mission statement or this banner, this mantra for the Christian, I'd kind of put it like this, that I am sent to share Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit to all people and make disciples. That's our mission statement. That's what we see all throughout scripture, that we are sent through the power of the Holy Spirit to people to make disciples. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10 is one of my favorite passages of scripture. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own, so that you may proclaim the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. You were once not a people, but now you are God's people. You were once shown no mercy, but now you have received mercy. Much like that song that we sang earlier, someone tells me that I have no right to speak the words of life that I do, I point them to the cross. Someone reminds me of what I had done in my past, I point them to the empty tomb. This is our story, that we were once in darkness. No one's gonna deny that. We were once dead and without hope, and yet because of God's heart for all people everywhere, we can have courage and move forward in boldness knowing that I am a chosen person by God a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people that God has redeemed for himself. There are a lot of things that when I think about you and I, or just people in general, that we can get really excited and really passionate about. Uh, I think a silly example, I, I look at this, I'm not a big like college football person, 
But uh, I go to tailgates, I go to games, and I see grown men lose their absolute minds if their team's not doing well. As passion, I see some, some passion in that. Men losing their minds, screaming at the TVs, getting super excited if their team does